we are going to start with disorders of the cortex. The approach is going to be, we are going to first revise the basic points about the cortex which includes the basic anatomy and the basic physiology of the cortex. Number two, we are going to do symptomatology of the cortex. Symptomatology of a cortex. Well, symptomatology is the bridge between theory and practical medicine because this is what connects the theory to the clinical world. So, symptomatology followed by, followed by the classification And finally, we will be discussing the individual disorders of the cortex. Individual disorders of the cortex, which we have already enumerated. The cerebrovascular accident, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, headache and infections. So, we are going to start with basic of cortex, symptomatology of cortex, classifying the disorders and then discussing individual diseases of the cortex. Let's start with the basic anatomy and physiology of the cortex. Everybody is aware, we are going to know that cortex basically is also called as the grey matter. Cortex is also called the grey matter. It is basically, it contains the cell body of the neuron. It is the core, it is the heart, it is the cell body of the neuron is the cortex. The cortex is broadly divided into two hemispheres. Divided into two hemispheres. So let me keep the clinical thread going. We have a patient sitting in front of us. We decided it is a pyramidal lesion. We said it is upper motor neuron lesion. Now we need to know whether it is cortical or not. Hence, we are doing this exercise to understand that what is the anatomy of the cortex, function of the cortex and the symptoms related to cortical affection. The cell body, two hemispheres of the cortex include the dominant hemisphere and the non-dominant hemisphere. Dominant hemisphere and the non-dominant hemisphere which are also called as categorical hemisphere and representational hemisphere representational hemisphere dominant hemisphere is also called categorical hemisphere non-dominant is also called representational hemisphere so my question to all of you how do you differentiate between the two? Which cortex is dominant? Which hemisphere is non-dominant? Well, the question is simple. As I have always told you, I want you to answer two things. First question, how to differentiate? How to identify? How to identify the dominant hemisphere is number one question. And the second question is why? Why? Why do we need to break our heads in order to identify the dominant hemisphere? It's not enough to know how. It's important to know why. That we will identify, we will include our test, we will do MRI. Patient has come back. What are we going to tell them? And that answer lies in the word why. So, you tell me, how do we do this? Well, first... The first thing that we are going to do to test for dominant hemisphere is to look for handedness. The concept of handedness, the name can be misleading if you just take it in the literal meaning. Let me clarify that handedness also includes the preferred limb that is preferred hand, the preferred leg the preferred eye and the preferred ear. All of them together make up handedness. If I have to ask you today standing here that which handed am I? All of you are going to chorus and say I am a right handed person. If I ask you why are you being so confident that I am a right handed individual? You all say that you are writing with your right hand. 
Sorry my friends, that's not the appropriate answer. Because, let me tell you, the way to identify, the test, to look for handedness, is to always ask to the patient to perform untrained, untrained activity. What we are supposed to tell the patient? To perform untrained activity. Writing, eating, the child does not know. We train them. We train them that you have to write with your right hand, eat with your right hand. They can be modified. So we have to ask the patient to perform untrained activity. So what's the thing? The common simple test that we can do when we are standing, if the patient is able to walk towards you, you tell the patient, just start walking towards me. I am not going to say that, you know, I am today is Tuesday, so right hand aage dalunga, left leg aage dalunga. I am going to put my preferred leg forward first. You all can try, get up, stand and start walking. Spontaneously, if you are a right handed person, your right leg will move forward first. That is one simple test. Second, throw a ball at yourself. What hand are you going to use it to catch? Always the preferred hand. You are going to hold all important objects using your preferred hand. A you know, very common thing we see on the road sometimes, you know, people are walking and carrying their mobile phone. They are on the scooter and they are talking like this. And we wonder, ah, what fools, why can't they use like and just talk simple like normal people. But mind you, it's all a trick of neurology. Let, us, let me tell you and give you this classical example I have seen many times. You know, when sometimes we are busy writing something, doing some homework, important things. And we pick up the mobile phone and we answer, put it to the left ear. I am a right handed person, mind you. So, my preferred ear is also the right ear. But I have answered my mobile phone with the left ear because of convenience. The moment the other side fellow, the, my friend tells me, uh, listen carefully, carefully, dhyan se sun. The moment that word is uttered carefully, immediately I say, uh, wait one minute and I switch it to the right ear. Now that is handedness. I am never going to prefer my left ear to listen to important things. The moment it is important, I always switch to the preferred ear, the preferred eye. And that is the way to identify handedness. So that is one step to identify the dominant hemisphere. What do we do with this handedness? Right, I have got it. We understood that the person is a right handed person. What information does it give us? Well, statistically. So we have to depend on statistic. That statistically, if the person is a right handed person, what do we see? That more than 90% have left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. But when we have a left handed person, still more than 60% of the patients have left hemisphere as the dominant hemisphere. So in one word, in the population, the left hemisphere is more commonly the dominant hemisphere. Whether you are right handed or whether you are left handed, more commonly among the population, the left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. So, we are able to check based on handedness, we are able to guess that right handed I am, I am likely to have my left hemisphere as the dominant hemisphere. But mind you, this is all statistic. Statistics are rarely admissible in the court of law. Definitely not in the ICU. Definitely not in the neurosurgeon's room. So, we need to be more concrete. We need to be sure. We cannot leave it to chance. More than 60%, more than 90%. We have to be sure. So, what is the test? What is the gold standard that we can use to check for the dominant hemisphere? The gold standard test is called the VADA test. The gold standard test to detect the dominant hemisphere is the VADA test where we are going to use a short acting barbiturate. We are going to use a short acting barbiturate. This test we all have read it in clinical textbooks that what am I going to do? I am going to inject the short acting barbiturate into the internal carotid artery 
into the internal carotid artery. Suppose I have left hemisphere as the dominant hemisphere and if this agent is injected in the left internal carotid artery what does the patient get? The patient develops transient aphasia. Transient aphasia. So we are going to use physiology that speech center the speech center is present only and only in the dominant hemisphere. So if I inject a short acting barbiturate into the left internal carotid artery in a patient with left hemisphere dominance, he or she is going to develop transient aphasia. Now, where have we actually identified a bit of trivia for you all? We have to always go back to history to make medicine interesting. This actually the test was invented during World War I and it was used as one of the techniques of torture to the patient. You know we have seen commonly in movies how the villains threaten the hero and the spies that you know you tell me or I'll shoot you huh? and they fire with an empty bullet and they show that I'm not meaning business. So here what they used to do with World War prisoners they used to inject into the internal carotid artery a shock acting barbiturate and they were unable to speak and they were petrified that this gentleman possesses some magic who can paralyze me for life very sad way of inventing it but still today it remains the gold standard of investigations in spite of the various advances made in the field of radiology there are definitely other tests the other test which can be used to identify dominance include MR spectroscopy which is also called as your functional MRIs. But for the MCQ, the still VADA test remains the gold standard to identify the dominant hemisphere. Now you have to ask me, I am not using the word you will ask me, I am requesting you to awake, be awake and ask me why should we test the dominant hemisphere.